Hello, my name is Neil Ferguson. I'm the Millbank Family Senior Fellow here at the Hoover Institution at Stanford. And one of my roles here is to chair the Hoover History Working Group. Uh, we just heard a brilliant presentation from uh, my old friend and former student, uh, Chris Miller, who is now Assistant Professor of International History at the Fletcher School at Tufts. Uh, Chris is a historian of Eurasia, Asia, uh, broadly defined. Uh, his first book was The Struggle to Save the Soviet Economy. Uh, he then wrote Putinomics, Power and Money in Resurgent Russia. And he's just published, or is just about to publish, a new book, We Shall Be Masters, Russian Pivots to East Asia from Peter the Great to Putin. What's striking about Chris's work is his ability to talk as authoritatively about Russia as about China and other adjoining geographies too. But he spoke to us today uh, with characteristic vision about another book, one that has not yet been written, but is the next uh, book in his uh, pipeline, a history of uh, semiconductors and the extraordinarily important role he argues that they played in deciding the outcome of the Cold War. Chris, it's great to have you here. Uh, let me begin by asking you a, a question about technology in, in history and particularly in the Cold War. I think most of us think about the Cold War in terms of technology uh, about being a nuclear war or it's being a space race. Uh, semiconductors haven't loomed so large in the literature. So why do you think semiconductors were the key? Well, thanks, Neil, for having me today. I, I think you're right that in the early decades of the Cold War, it's true that rockets and nuclear weapons were the fundamental technologies that mattered, both in terms of their political impact, but also in terms of their military relevance. But if you zoom forward to the 1970s and 1980s, the nature of military power was fundamentally changing. By the end of the 1980s, the US military had rolled out a suite of new weapons which were fundamentally more accurate than anything that had ever been used before. And this accuracy was only possible because there were tiny computers crammed into the nose of these missiles and bombs. These computers worked with semiconductors that were made ever smaller and more powerful each year. And you can't understand this revolution in accuracy without understanding the chips that they relied upon. So why was it that the United States was able to forge ahead with semiconductors and the Soviet Union just couldn't catch up? Because clearly the US forged ahead with nuclear weapons, but the Soviets did catch up. In the space race, uh, there was a time when it seemed that the Soviets uh, were ahead. What made this technology different from the, the other technologies of the time? Well, the striking thing about Soviet semiconductors is that the USSR tried the same tactics that had worked with atomic weapons and worked with the space race. They stole an extraordinary amount of technology. They tried to copy everything that they could, but copying only works when you've got technologies that change slowly. But semiconductors are propelled forward by Moore's law, which says that every couple of years, the amount of computing power on a single silicon chip will roughly doubles. You've got exponential growth in quality, exponential growth in computing power. And if you try to copy that, you can succeed. But in the time it takes you to copy, you'll be left several years and several orders of magnitude behind. And that was the fundamental dilemma the Soviet Union couldn't figure out how to deal with. They only knew how to copy, and that guaranteed technological backwardness. Now, we're accustomed at the Hoover Institution to think that Ronald Reagan uh, won the Cold War or perhaps it was Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush, at any event that it, it happened in the 1980s. But you take a somewhat contrarian view that really the decisive uh, breakthroughs came earlier in the 1970s and in the Carter administration. And the only saving grace is that in your story, uh, current Hoover Fellow plays a crucial role. Tell us more about William Perry and the uh, the arrival of Silicon Valley uh, in, uh, in Washington, D.C. Well, William Perry arrived at the Pentagon to be the Undersecretary for Research and Engineering in charge of R&D at the Pentagon uh, in the late 1970s, just after the U.S. withdrawal from Vietnam. 
It was a time of defense spending cuts. The military was looking to spend its R&D dollars as efficiently as possible to gain an advantage over the Soviet Union. And Perry had worked his entire career in Silicon Valley. He knew personally a number of the founders of Silicon Valley's biggest chip firms. And he understood more clearly than anyone in Washington how rapidly semiconductors were improving and how Moore's law was driving forward computing power at an exponential rate of increase. When you applied this to the guidance computers inside bombs and missiles, Perry realized uh, accuracy would be transformed and America could leap ahead in terms of military power, even if it didn't match the Soviet Union tank for tank, plane for plane. And that's exactly what he invested in in the late 1970s. One of the most exciting and for me persuasive parts of your presentation was your evidence that the Soviets knew this, that the Soviet military understood perhaps earlier than uh, that, than anyone in the West realized that the game was up and they were going to lose the Cold War. Talk a little bit about those Soviet generals who saw the future and saw what it meant uh, for their position. Well, if you read the papers of the Soviet general staff starting in the late 1970s, but especially in the early 1980s, you'll find uh, a theory of the reconnaissance strike complex, which was the Soviet phrase for what the US military was investing in, new reconnaissance, new surveillance, and above all, more accuracy in these munitions. And when the Soviets ran the war games, uh, envisioned what would happen uh, if they went to war with the United States, they found they would lose uh, more often than they would win. And they also saw the trends continuing to go in the wrong direction. The longer they, they waited, the more and more their military would fall behind. So by the early 1980s, although everyone in Washington hadn't realized it, in Moscow, it was clear to Soviet military officials that they had lost the arms race in the Cold War, uh, simply because they couldn't keep up uh, with the revolution and accuracy that Silicon Valley had enabled the Pentagon to pursue. Other regimes in history have realized they're falling behind technologically and embarked on reforms. Uh, uh, one thinks here of late 19th century uh, Ottoman reforms or Qing Chinese reforms. But in the case of the Soviet Union, uh, the supposed cure, perestroika and glasnost, ended up killing the patient. Uh, now, from the vantage point of the, the Soviet military, uh, Gorbachev was supposed to be the solution to the problem. Why did it turn out so very badly uh, for the Soviet empire when Gorbachev began his reforms? Gorbachev somewhat correctly diagnosed the problem. He launched a policy called the Scientific Technical Revolution in the early days of perestroika, which was designed to spend more on R&D and uh, produce more advanced technologies. But the Soviet R&D apparatus simply wasn't capable of catching up. There was no private sector in the Soviet Union uh, to drive innovation. The only customer for high tech was the Soviet military. And as a result, the incentives just weren't aligned uh, to let Soviet scientists produce effective technologies and spread them across Soviet society. Uh, the Soviet Union had no history of doing this, it had no capability, the institutions weren't there. And so even though everyone in Moscow realized technology ought to be a priority, it's one thing to say it and something else to do it. And the Soviet Union just couldn't find a way to uh, replicate what was possible in Silicon Valley. Fast forward to our own time and another superpower run by a communist party seems to be doing a lot better at not only copying uh, Western technology, but actually being able to keep up uh, with the rapid uh, technological change uh, implied by Moore's law. I'm talking, of course, about the People's Republic of China. What are the implications of uh, your research for the current Cold War, if that's the right term, the current uh, arms race, technological race between the United States and China? Might this one turn out differently, or do you see some of the same problems perhaps arising for, uh, for the Chinese as, as arose for the Russians back in the 1970s and 80s? I think there are two lessons that stand out from the first Cold War. One is the extent to which digital technology will drive military power. That's been the case since the 1970s, and there's no evidence that's going away. So whichever power dominates the future of computing, is also likely to dominate the future of military power. So the question in my mind is, can the PRC produce better semiconductors and more computing power 
than the US and its allies. And I think it's crucial here to differentiate between what the Chinese government says it wants and what it's actually doing. If you look at how the Chinese government is spending uh, funds today, what it's doing is funneling them through state-owned corporations that have a horrible track record at technology investment. There is a vibrant uh, technology sector in China, but it's all in the private sector. Most of the Chinese government's spending uh, is going through state-owned firms. And this is a recipe that's repeatedly failed to provide innovation in China. And there's, I think, as a result, very little reason to think that it's going to work better in the future. Chris, uh, I can't wait to read this book. And I'm curious to know what title it's likely to have when Daniel Jürgen tried to sum up uh, the, the geopolitical significance of oil, he called the book The Prize. Uh, what's this book going to be called? I can't imagine Semiconductor or Microprocessor making it into a modern book title. The, the current title is Chip Wars, uh, to underscore the extent to which the military balance has fundamentally depended on uh, these tiny silicon chips. Well, at some point, someone's going to ask you to change that to the chips are down or something along those lines. I hope you'll resist any uh, such corny puns. Chris, it's been a pleasure to have you here, Hoover. I know everybody who attended the seminar will be rushing out to buy the book when it comes out. Uh, meanwhile, good luck with your latest publication. And thanks for being so farsighted as to preview the next one, even before this one is even on the bookshelves. Chris Miller, thanks very much. Thank you.